allow us to continue from yesterday's lecture and explanations. Yesterday we spoke of the dharmic life, the life which is not composed or not based in atta, self. And we also spoke of the non-dharmic life, the life which is made up of, composed of, self, of atta. Today, to investigate this further, we'd like to talk about the datus or natural elements. This is the teaching of no man or the teaching of no person. If we speak on an even deeper level, we would say even further that this is the teaching of no sentient being. This is the teaching that there is no sattva, no sentient being or no, no person no individual. Rather, there are merely natural elements. If you think this is something strange and that there's, it's not very interesting, then you won't pay much attention, you won't listen very well, and you won't be able to understand to see that there is, there is nothing but these datus or natural elements is to see that there is no atta, no self, or no atman, no self. But there are merely these natural elements and they are anatta or not self. If we're going to investigate this subject, we need to take some time to consider the word datu or element. <clears throat> the word datu or in Thai ta has the same root or the same stem as the word dharma. And this root means to to uphold or to cherish, to maintain, to cherish. The difference between these two words, dhatu and dharma, are not so great. But the basic difference is that dhatu is something that upholds itself, whereas dhamma not only uphold itself, but it upholds anyone who practices the Dhamma. The word Datu has a rather scientific character, whereas the word Dhamma has a more moral bent to it. The word Dhamma lends itself to speaking about moral issues, whereas Datu is more easily used for speaking scientifically. Therefore, when we consider the word datu, we need to study it in a scientific way. Unlike dhamma, which we study more in a moral way. When we study these things according to philology or the study of the origin of words, then we see that both dhatu and dharma have the same root and their literal meaning is something that upholds itself, sustains itself. But if we speak in a more natural way, when we speak of dhatus, we mean the last, the last things you come to when we've um, analyzed or separated things into their 
their smallest parts or aspects. So a datu is what you've got once you've analyzed something as far as possible. Even though some datus can be analyzed into other datus which make it up. Many datus are, can be analyzed into their constituent datus. Still, if we continue this analysis, what we end up with in the end are merely datus. Now if we investigate the datus, we will discover that there are two categories of datus. The first is the sankata tat or sankata datu, and the second is the asankata datu. Literally, the word sankata datu means something that is concocted or conditioned by causes and conditions or something that has causes and conditions concocting, creating it. Anything that has this characteristic of being concocted by and dependent upon causes and conditions is called Sankata Datu. Thus, the Sankata Datu has the characteristic of constant change. They arise, establish themselves, and fade away. They arise, establish themselves, and disappear. This constant arising, establishing, and dis disappearing, or ceasing, shows the nature of constant change of the Sankata Dhatus. The Asankata Dhatu is the opposite. There are no causes or conditions concocting it. It doesn't depend on any causes and conditions. And so it doesn't change. It, <clears throat> it is um, totally stable or immutable. This is the Asankata Datu. We can understand the Asankata Datu in, by its being the opposite of that which changes, which arises and passes away. The Asankata Datu is something very profound and very hard to understand but we can understand it through understanding that which changes, which depends on causes and conditions, namely the Sankata Datu. To understand these two words, we can borrow some terms from psychology. There is the term phenomenon, phenomenon, which refers to the objects of experience which arise and cease. Anything that arises due to causes and conditions and then ceases, things which have the nature of change and impermanence are called phenomenon. And then there's that which is the total opposite of phenomenon, that which doesn't arise or cease, which doesn't depend on anything. This is called the noumena, the noumena. The word phenomenon is plural. Phenomenon are endless, countless, infinite. But noumena is singular. These two terms will help us quite a bit to understand the meanings of Sankata Datu and Asankata Datu. Another way 
of looking at these terms that will help you to understand them is to understand that the Sankata Datu has the characteristic or nature of being Sankara. San Sankara means making together or fabricating, putting things together to get something new. This is Sankara, which we translate as concocting. So the, uh, san the, the Sankata Datu has the nature of concocting, of constant change and concoction. As for the Asankata Datu, it has the nature of Visankara. Visankara is the opposite of Sankara. It means non-concocting, no concocting. There's nothing being fabricated, produced, or anything like that. So the Asankata Datu is Visankara, unconcocted non-concocting. There are two words that will help us to understand the Asankata Datu. These words will be very difficult to understand, so please listen carefully. And if you play, pay proper attention, you should be able to understand them. The first term is Nibbana Datu. Nibbana Datu. This Datu is the Datu or natural element which quenches all Sankharas. All the changing impermanent things are quenched in Nibbana Datu, the element which quenches all other elements. The second term is sunyata datu, sunyata datu. This element there is no, in this element there is no concoction. Nothing is concocted by it. And so it is void and free. This is the, the datu of voidness, freedom from all concocting and concoction. We call it sunyata datu, sunyata datu. A third term is sacha datu, the datu of truth. When we speak of the datu of truth, we mean the law which is unchanging, which is fixed. If it still changes, if it's not fixed, then it's not really true. It can't really be called a law. We can only call something a law if it's truly unchanging and eternal. So another name for what we're speaking of is the Sacha Datu, the natural element of truth. That which is free and independent within itself, depending on nothing else and therefore never changing. Each of these two kinds of datus has their own essence. The essence of Sankata Datu is that of change, of flux. Their nature is one of change. The essence of Asankata Datu is the opposite. It never changes, it's unchanging, immutable. This is the unchanging essence of Asankata Datu. Another way of comparing the two is in terms of quantity. When speaking of quantity, the Asankata Datu are countless, infinite. There are so many that we could never count them. But the Asankata Datu is singular, unique, there is only one. Just as when we spoke of phenomenon, which are countless, innumerable, and the noumena, 
which is singular. When an ordinary person speaks, they say that there are some things which are datus or elements, and there are other things which are not datus, which are not elements. In the in ordinary scientific language, there are the things which are considered elements and things which are not considered elements. But in Dhamma language, in the language of supreme meaning, of the highest, most profound meaning, then we say that there is nothing which is not Datu. There isn't anything which is not a datu in some form. In the Dhamma language, everything, without, without even one exception, are datus. In modern science, they speak of elements, but when they speak of the mind, they don't call it, consider it to be an element or datu. But in Dhamma or in Buddhism, even the mind is a datu made up of datu. In Buddhism, all things are considered to be datu. The physical, the mental, and even the spiritual are nothing but datu. Even what is called spirituality is just another datu. In Dhamma language, there are some datus which are um, on their own or unmixed with others. And there are other datus which are mixed together with other datus. In ordinary science, they speak only of elements in when you've broken things down to their their smallest bits and pieces, before, at least until they go on to the subatomic level. But once you put them together, if you put different elements together, they no longer call it a datu. They call it a molecule or on another level an alloy. But in Dhamma language, whether it's a datu by itself or many datus mixed together, even those mixed together datus is still considered to be a datu. Take, for example, water. In the language of Buddhism, the water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is a datu. The oxygen is a datu. And when the hydrogen and oxygen are combined in, to make water, that is a datu. You can call it the water element. And so no matter how many datus we put together, all we get is another datu. This is how we speak in Buddhism. And so one needs to be careful not to get confused by the terminology. The more narrow meaning of the, the modern use of the word element should not confuse one's this more all-encompassing meaning of the word datu. Now let's look in more detail at the sankata datu, because this is the datu that is totally involved in our lives. This is what our life is made up of, the sankata datus, so we should examine it in detail. When speaking of the Sankata Datus, if we look at this life here, there is the body, 
there's the body which is made up which we can call rupa or the rupa datu or the form and then there is the thing called jitta or mind and then there are the things which condition the mind which make the mind happen and then the things which are connected or associated with the mind these are called chetasika so there is the body or form rupa and then there is the mind chitta and then there are the the qualities or characteristics let's you say the qualities of the mind the things associated with the mind which are called jetasika so we can say that there is the the ruba datu this body or form is just a datu we can call it the rupa datu the form element and then the mind is just another datu the datu which experiences feels thinks this we can call the jitta datu the mind element and then there are the things which the mind thinks feels experiences all the things connected and associated with the mind and these are called the jetasika datu so there are in this life there are these three datus the form datu the mind datu and the um mental factors datu this way of speaking nobody has said before we don't we haven't come across others saying this but to say that this life is made up of these three datus is totally in line with nature and so we're free to to say it that this that it is very true that life is made up of these three datus the form datu the mind datu and the mental factors datu then there is one more very special datu called the asankata datu or the nibbana datu this is the datu which is the the quenching point where all other datus cease all the sankata datus just mentioned are quenched in the nibbana datu this kind of datu is much different than the ordinary datu so it's a whole different kind of datu the datu in which all other elements are quenched or extinguished when one datu um gives way to another datu when one datu there's one datu and then there's another datu for this to happen depends on the element of cessation for there's one datu and then it must cease for the next datu to appear this datu in which which is the cessation of the ordinary datus is called nirota datu the element of cessation this isn't the same as the nibbana datu where the sankata datus are quenched thoroughly but this is a temporary quenching or cessation so we call it nirota datu and so all the sankata datus mental physical and what have you are quenched or cease in this nirota datu it's only because of this cessation element that there is any possibility for change or evolution 
if there wasn't this cessation element, nothing could change. But this datu must cease to make so that another datu can arise. The transformation from this datu into that datu only happens because of the nirota datu or the element of cessation. So all the sankata datus or all change, all, all worldly life depends on not only the sankata datus but this asankata datu or the element of cessation. Some of you might be thinking that there's too many of these datus now and it's not worth trying to remember them all. But please don't think like that. We beg of you to not dismiss this matter of the datus because in our lives there's just the flow of datus one after the other. There's nothing but datus arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing one after the other so fast that we most of us aren't even able to keep track. Whether we speak of the rupa datus, the form element, or the jita datus, the mind element, or the jetasika datus, the mental constituents elements, these arise and cease, arise and cease very rapidly in our life. Since this is what our life is made up of, just the, arise and the arising and cessation of all these different elements or datus, it's something that deserves our fullest attention. It's not something to be dismissed just because we have to remember some new words and pay attention to something that's difficult to understand. So please give this your careful attention, the facts of these datus which make up our lives. Now let's talk about some mental things. Let's talk about things in your own mind. When your mind is satisfied with sensuality or with sex, when there is this satisfaction with sen sexuality, that is called gama datu or kama datu. Not karma, but kama datu. When this element of sexuality, and in such moments, this kama datu dominates your mind. Your mind is taken over by this element of sexuality and the mind is under its power. Even sex and sexuality is just another datu. It's called kama datu. And then there are the times when, when you're bored with sex when you're tired or weary of sexuality and then you pull yourself out from the world of sexuality and put your attention and interest on something non-sensual something like you take a quiet walk on the beach or you, you enjoy the beauty of a tree where your mind is then concerned with something material but it's no longer sensual or sexual. This is called rupa datu, the material element or the form element. In moments like this when you're enjoying a sunrise or sunset and the mind is still concerned with the material world but is not being sensual about it. This is when your mind is 
made up by the form elements. Your mind is dominated by the form elements. This is when your mind is under the power of the Rupa Dasi. Sometimes even the Rupa Dhatu is too much for us. <clears throat> We've had enough of it. It's, it's too much trouble. It's too busy. And then those are moments when we, we don't want to have anything to do with anything. We don't want to mess around with anything. And when the mind can leave alone not only the Kama Dhatu, but also the Rupa Dhatu, so that it, there's nothing in the mind, no thoughts or nothing like that. This is, this, even this is a Dhatu. Now this is very hard to do. Sometimes it can be done using very deep concentration. When the mind can absorb totally in nothingness, and this, when the mind is full of nothing, this experience of nothingness, this is still just a dhatu. It's called the aruba dhatu, the immaterial or the formless element. So even that which has no form, which is, has nothing tangible or material about it, even that is an element. This is very hard to experience, but there are times when the mind doesn't want to have anything to do with the sensual and material worlds. And when it leaves the, those dhatus alone, and then there is just the dhatu of nothingness, this is when the mind is dominated or taken over by the Arupa Dhatu, the formless element. Now don't, don't mistake this for the Nibbana Dhatu or Asankata Dhatu. This formless element, although there's nothing disturbing or troubling the mind, it's not the same as Nibbana Dhatu. In an ordinary life, most of the time is spent with our minds dominated by the Kama Dhatu. Most of our ordinary life is dominated by sex and sensuality. Our mind is taken over by this very low level of existence. The mind is under the power of the Kama Dhatu. But there are times when one becomes tired of that because it's so troublesome. One is, when one is weary of the trouble of the Kama Dhatu, then one can get free of it. And then one's mind rests in the Rupa Dhatu. For example, you might garden or collect stamps or go mountain climbing, or some kind of artistic expression or crafts. Still dealing with material things, but in a non-sensual way. This is then, the mind is now under the power of the Rupa Dhatu. You have to go against the mind's tendency to do this. It takes effort to get free of the element of sensuality in order to associate with the, the form element. But there are times when that can be done. But then there are times when one sees that even the form element is, is troublesome. One sees the difficulty and hassle not only of sensuality but of forms. And then the mind leaves them both alone to rest in the arupa element, the arupa dhatu, 
the formless element. This is an even higher level of consciousness. It's much more subtle and refined. So these are three levels that the mind can live on. The ordinary crude level of sex and sensuality, the level of kamadhatu, and then a more refined and peaceful level of rupadhatu, and then the level which is even more refined and peaceful, that of arupadhatu. These are the three levels in which our minds usually exist or dwell. Most of the time in our ordinary lives, our minds are totally taken over by kamadhatu. Our minds indulge in and are in obsessed, totally lost in kamadhatu. Just consider how much this happens and all the troubles and difficulties it causes. The vast majority of the hassles and troubles, problems of our ordinary lives are because of the kamadhatu. Just a few examples are such as people get married, they become wife and husband because of kamadhatu. And then also be, and we don't have to explain all the difficulties and tribulations of marriage to you. And then, Kamadhatu is also the cause of people getting divorced because of their, their ways of dealing with Kamadhatu, they get up, they end up getting divorced. And then we're not even talking about the problems of people merely living together without getting married. All the kinds of troubles and problems that happen to people, the vast majority are because of kamadhatu. But some people, or sometimes, one has had enough of that. One is tired of the troubles, all the struggle, all the hassle. And then one, maybe the wife will go off to be a nun and the husband a monk in order to leave behind the, the world of Kamadhatu. And then if they do it properly, they live much more on the level of Rupadhatu, where they can leave alone sensuality and sex and then the mind is on a finer material level, that of Rupa Dhatu. And then those who are really good at it, those who are really skillful, can leave behind even Rupa Dhatu and live with <coughs> a Rupa Dhatu. For example, those whose mind is always on God, the person who's thinks of nothing but God. This is to dwell in the Arupadhatu. So these are the three elements of our, of our lives. The very troublesome one of Kamadhatu, the less troublesome one of Rupadhatu, and the very refined element of Arupadhatu. would like to advise you to try out a new sport, to play this kind of, this sport the way people are playing all the different sports in the world. This sport, let your mind be with the kamatatu for a while. Let the mind dwell in the kamatatu under the power of the kamatatu and see what that is like, how it dominates the mind, and all the rest. And then, on the next level, leave alone the kamadhatu. Raise up the mind a bit so it's no longer feeling any sensual, sexual connections with things. 
the mind is no longer sensually involved with anything and is on the level of Rupa Datu. And try out that level for a while. Play with that level of existence. And then, then move to the next level where the mind has no feelings of no sexual feelings and no material feelings. There's just pure mind or pure consciousness. And experience that for a while. This later one is very difficult, but we encourage you to give it a try. Try out this new sport of investigating or experiencing Kama Tatu, then moving up to Rupa Datu, and then lastly Arupa Tatu. Datu. Now please don't understand these principles and make even more trouble for yourself. Don't think that to escape from the hassles and troubles of Kamatatu that one should go out and go to the movies or go out drinking or dancing and things. This is not what we're suggesting. One sh we're not saying that one should escape from the difficulties of Kamadatu by getting into even more troublesome and harmful things. Instead of lowering the mind even into even cruder levels of Kama or dealing with material things which are even more troublesome, one, one organizes life in an orderly way so it, that things fit together and go smooth and aren't all complicated and troublesome. So don't go from, don't try to escape the problems of the element of sexuality by doing even cruder things, but learn how to raise the mind up to a more refined, more peaceful level of Rupa Datu. And if you can do it, try to raise it up to the level even of a Rupa Datu. If you can do this in an orderly, balanced, peaceful way, it will be very useful for your life. When <clears throat> one is tired and worn out with Kama Datu, and then one deals with that by going to sleep. To sleep is not kama datu. It's not a sensual matter. And it's not even really rupa datu. But when one sleeps and one finds some peace and happiness in sleeping, this should be considered a rupa datu, the formless element although on a rather crude low level of the formless element. We just bring up this point to illustrate that one has to put the different elements in their place. One has to arrange the elements in one's life so that they're in proper proportion and balance. If we can do that, then our life goes quite smoothly and there aren't unnecessary hassles and troubles when there's a proper balance among Kama Datu, Rupa Datu, and Arupa Datu. But if we can't do this, if these Datus are a mess, if we haven't got them arranged in an orderly fashion, then we won't have really discovered the potential in life. We'll just keep making more and more trouble for ourselves. Life will be full of ha unnecessary hassles if we're not able to understand and properly arrange these three datus. 
you should know further that even happiness is a dhatu, the thing we call sukha, happiness or joy, is just another dhatu. And then even dukkha, pain, is a dhatu. And then the feeling that is neither pleasant nor painful, which we call a dukkha masukha, this too is a dhatu. Both happiness, pain, and the feelings that can't be class distinguished whether they're the feelings that we're uncertain whether it's pleasant or painful. All three of these are are just dhatus. The sukha dhatu or happiness element disturbs the mind in one way. The dukkha dhatu or pain element disturbs the mind in another and makes creates dukkha in the mind. And then the element which is neither pleasant nor painful, that still disturbs the mind because one's uncertain what's going on. There's still a kind of feeling disturbing the mind. So, although this may seem like even more things to remember, you should know that happiness, pain, and that uncertain feeling, that all of these are still dhatus. Modern science, the kind of science you study in the schools and universities, probably won't accept that happiness and pain are elements. But in Buddhist science, or the science of awakening, happiness and pain, like everything else, are merely dhatus, or natural elements. Because modern science is solely interested in material things, they, it doesn't recognize that things like pleasure and pain are just other dhatus, just natural elements. So if we wish to have a real understanding of life, we must go beyond the limits of modern material science and take an interest in Buddhist science, which studies all the dhatus, not just the material elements. To speak even further, there's good and evil, or what in the Pali language are called kusala, which is goodness or skillfulness, wholesomeness and akusala, evilness or unskillfulness, unwholesomeness. And then there's apayakrita, which is means unclassifiable, that which can be classified as good or evil, wholesome or unwholesome. Don't be surprised to hear that even these three are elements the kusala dhatu, akusala dhatu, and apayagrita dhatu. These are all dhatus. When it, when anything arises and performs its function, then it is considered to be a dhatu. Anything that functions in the way proper to itself, in its own way, is a dhatu, including the element of goodness, the element of unwholesomeness, and the unclassifiable element. The word good can be rather ambiguous, but it comes closest to the Pali word kusala, Literally, kusala means to cut, cut off one's enemies, to cut off the enemies. By enemies, we mean all undesirable, harmful things. All the low, 
destructive, undesirable things are what we mean by kus, uh, are by enemies. Things such as bad tempers, the bad moods we get into in ordinary life, all kinds of low, um, <clears throat> evil thoughts. When these undesirable, destructive thoughts and feelings, moods are cut off, that's the meaning of kusala or good. Akusala means that we're not able to cut off these things, that we can't get rid of these bad moods, bad thoughts, bad tempers, and so on. And then apyagrita is one where we can classify it as cutting them off or not cutting them off. Even these are datus. When we can cut off, get rid of all the lowly, undesirable, destructive things, so the mind is, doesn't exist on a low, harmful level. That's the meaning of kusala. When the mind is still caught up in low, unseemly, undesirable, harmful things, that's the meaning of akusala. And when it's all vague and uncertain, where one can't establish it as either kusala or akusala, that's called apayagrita. So whether we call them good, bad, and neutral, or akusala, akusala, and apayagrita, these three things are merely elements, merely natural datus. And now we'll come to some very silly datus, quite humorous datus. The masculinity datu and the femininity datu, the element of being male and the element of being female. So that you don't misunderstand these, please listen carefully. When you're born with either a male body or a female body, and so they write on your birth certificate male or female, then you go and think that you're a male all the time or a female all the time. This kind of thinking and understanding is not in line with the truth of the datus. That's not how it really is. The mind ordinarily, the ordinary mind is neutral the ordinary mind as it exists is just neutral. But when the datu of masculinity takes over the mind, then the mind becomes male. Or when the datu of femininity takes over the mind, then the mind becomes female. But ordinarily the mind is just neutral. It's neither male or female. It only becomes male or female when the respective elements of masculinity and femininity take, take it over. But ordinarily, it's just neutral. In Pali, this is called the, the papatsara jita. Papatsara means radiant or luminous. Ordinarily, naturally, the mind is luminous, radiant. But if one or the other of these datus takes it over, only then does it become male or female. So please understand this first point, that ordinarily the mind is radiant, it's neutral. And then we'll explain further. Okay, now... So the mind is naturally neutral or luminous. Now, that our bodies, say for example, one group of people has a body that has female organs, female sexual organs, and has a feminine shape. 
and then another group of people have bodies with male sex organs and male characteristics, a male shape. And then inside, one group has certain glands and a hormonal system which is female. And then the other group inside the body has glands and a hormonal system which is male. Now these are just natural. The body, the nature has created bodies in these ways and it's solely natural. And these sex organs and glands and hormones are created by nature to operate once the elements of masculinity or femininity take over the mind. When the element, the female element, takes over the mind of a person with a female body, then that female body, the sex organs, the hormones, the glands, begin in it to operate in a way that serves the femininity that's taken over the mind. And the same in the male, when the male element takes over the mind, <clears throat> then the male sex organs and male hormones click into action in order to serve and satisfy that masculine element that's dominating the mind. This is how it works naturally. And we hope you can understand this. But it's important to see that originally, fundamentally, the mind is neither male nor female. It only becomes male or female when the respective male and female datus take it over. And that's when the, the male and female characteristics of the body come into play. They come into play later, only when stimulated by the, male, the mind that has become male or female. Now normally this these elements of masculine and feminine are not called datus. Most often they go by another word, the word indriya, indriya. Indriya means that which is supreme or dominant. It's the dominating factor or dominating power or that, that factor which is supreme. So when the when maleness dominates the mind, that's called the male dominating factor, or the Pali word is purisa indriya or purisindriya. Purisindriya. We're sorry that you we use all these new words for you, but we hope you can at least get the meaning. And then when the, when femininity dominates the mind, that's the female dominating factor, or the iti indriya, the itindriya is the feminine dominating, the dominating factor of femininity. When this purisindriya, or the dominating factor of masculinity, takes over the mind, then the mind has maleness. Or when the iti in itindriya, the dominating factor of femininity, takes over the mind, then the mind has femaleness or femininity. But the mind naturally is neither male or female. It only becomes one or the other when the corresponding indriya or dominating factor takes it over. Now these are also just datus, so we can also speak of the, although it's usually called the, the dominating factor of maleness, we can just call it the masculine element. And we can call the itindriya, 
the dominating factor of femaleness, the feminine, the feminine element, and whichever takes over the mind, the mind then takes on that quality, although originally the mind is neither male nor female. Although the, the body's sexual organs are always there, and although the glands and hormones are always there, although the hormone levels fluctuate, these may be there all the time, but there is not, the mind is not male or female all the time. Please try to understand this. There are times when the mind is neither male or female. For example, after engaging in sexual activity to the point where you're, you're worn out. And then as you're resting afterwards, there's no maleness or femaleness. Or while, while asleep, if sleeping soundly, although the body remains male or female, the mind is neither male or female. The mind only becomes male or female. It only takes on masculine and feminine characteristics when the, the male datu or the female datu takes over. It's only when the, the dominating factor of femininity, the itindriya, or the dominating factor of masculinity, the purisindriya, it's only when these take over and dominate the mind, that's when the mind takes on feminine or masculine qualities. So please pay careful attention to this. Notice the many times in life when the mind is neither male or female. If you can understand this properly, then you will be able to manage this business of male and female properly. If one can manage these things or control masculinity and femininity, they won't cause problems for us. If we can understand that the mind is not inherently male or female, if we can really understand this, then we can control masculinity and femininity, and it won't create any more problems or any more dukkha for us. So please try to exor- observe when the mind is neither male nor female. Right now you are all listening very intently to what we are saying. You're listening very carefully, and so right at this moment there is no masculinity or femininity in the mind. The masculine, the element or the indriyas of masculinity and femininity aren't dominating the mind because there are other factors which are supreme. For example, one wants to know, so one is listening, or one wants to understand, or at least there is sata, trust, confidence. Because some other factor is dominant and the mind is trying its best to listen, there is no space for the femininity or masculinity elements to take over the mind. And so the mind is neither male or female. It doesn't have male and female characteristics. The sex organs may still be there. The glands and the hormones may still be there. The physical apparatus of male and female may be there. But the mind is neither male nor female. It only becomes male or female when the the element or indriya, the dominating factor, takes over. So please try to understand this, not just intellectually, but also by observing the reality of it in life. If you are successful in your study and understanding of paticca samupada, dependent origination, 
as well as in your investigation and practice of anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, then you will have the sufficient knowledge and ability to deal wisely and successfully with the datus. If you truly understand dependent origination and have thoroughly practiced mindfulness with breathing, then you will be able to manage and control all the datus. None of the datus, including those of masculinity and femininity, will pose any problems for you anymore. None of the datus will create any trouble or dukkha. So we wish you success in your study of dependent origination and your practice of mindfulness with breathing. Please give it your best and we wish you success. All of our explanation can be summarized in a few short words. When you thoroughly understand the datus, then there will remain, there will not remain any more feelings or thoughts of atta, self, or atman. And then you won't have any more problems in life. When you really understand the datus, you won't feel that there is a atta or self and your problems will end. So finally, thank you for being very good listeners. So please take the things which have been discussed and think them over, reflect upon them, investigate them to deepen your understanding of what we've been discussing as well as life. And then we hope that you are successful in practicing. So we hope that you will be very successful and will continue with your practice. There are some more things to talk about, which we will talk about at a later time. But for now, this is enough. Thank you for being good listeners.